Today, we're going to be learning from the book of Matthew chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, turn there to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to continue the ministry of Jesus in succession. So last week we preached on Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 men and women and children. Some argue that there were somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 people, 20, people that were there that Jesus and the disciples fed with two fish and five loaves of bread. I believe that Jesus actually fed that multitude from that quantity of food, from the provision that God provided through that young boy who brought it to the disciples. The disciple Andrew being the one who actually found the kid as it was time to eat. And the kid was unwrapping his little foil right there. And he had, he had um, a couple of fried fish and he had a couple of rolls of, of Hawaiian bread right there that he was getting ready to throw down on that probably his mom or his grandma had just packed for him for the day. <clears throat> And the disciples had wanted to send all the people back to the villages and towns where they came from because it was late and Jesus had them there. He had he had um, a captive audience and there was nowhere near them where they could go to eat in a short time. And Jesus says, no, let's feed them with what we have so that they can continue to be fed the spiritual word as well. And they they broke bread. And the Bible says Jesus gave thanks it's another, another symbol and representation of the Last Supper or what we call the Eucharist, which means the time of giving thanks. And from there, the Bible says the multitudes left and they were well fed, you know, um, materially, and they were well fed spiritually. And it was a great harvest that day for Jesus and the disciples. And they saw Jesus's miracles being put into action. They saw faith into action. And then the Bible says Jesus needed to go and rest. So he went up to a mountainside so that he could find peace and quiet. Do we got any parents in here that sometimes need peace and quiet? Raise your hand. And no offense to you kids, and I'm not apologizing for it, but I tell you what, kiddos, sometimes us parents need a break, a rest, peace and quiet from you. Can I get an amen? My wife says, no, no, we can't go. The baby needs to get a nap. And then I ask her, does the baby need a nap or do you need a break? She's just like, oh, you better stop. But I got my wife figured out. She gets a nap, the baby gets a nap, and I'm one happy camper. Because if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Nobody happy. So Jesus goes and finds and seeks some peace and quiet up on the mountainside. Says that he actually prayed and he looked to heaven and he said, Father God, restore me because I just poured out a whole lot. Father God, feed me because I just fed your people. Father God, the shepherd now needs to be ministered to because the shepherd just got finished ministering everything that he had. So Jesus went and he, he plugged back in. He had to go and get recharged. He had to go and, and plug in to the source of the universe. And God began to pour back into his son, Jesus. When all of a sudden, they came and broke Jesus's peace and quiet. They broke into it. They interrupted Jesus right in the middle of his quiet time, right in the middle of, you know, that time that he needed. They came and interrupted it and, and cut it short. And they said, Jesus, Jesus, come and do this. Come and do that. And he goes, oh, man, I don't know about that. So Jesus tended to their need. He broke away from his time of peace and quiet. He came down to see the multitudes, continued to minister to them again. And after that, he told his disciples, OK, all right, this is enough. You guys now go on ahead. You guys get into the boat. Jesus actually commanded them. Get into the boat and you guys go on ahead to the other side of the lake. And I'm going to go and catch up with you there. So after Jesus sent his disciples to get back into the boat, they went on ahead. It was already nighttime. Scripture says that Jesus went back up to the mountain to continue what he had started. 
He was insisting on the fact that he needed that time with the Father. You know, sometimes in our busy lives, you have to insist on getting the, the peace and quiet, that devotional time that you need with Jesus. Sometimes you need to insist that mom, that, that grandma, that, that, that daddy, that grandpa needs so that I can, I will have what it takes to finish the day strong. So that I won't start pulling my hair out, going crazy, dealing with all the stresses and all the anxieties of life. So that I won't be tempted to go plug back into social media and keep checking every 10 or 15 minutes. Do you know one of the most restful and peaceful days that you would ever have is by disconnecting from technology and from social media for a whole day? If you ever just need a day to fast and food isn't the thing on the menu that you're looking to fast for, set aside technology, set aside your constant checking in of social media. I guarantee you, don't even check it before you go to bed. Go to bed and get a good night's rest. You will wake up refreshed. You will wake up empowered. You will wake up without, without all of the stress, stresses and all of the problems of the world knocking on the door of your heart. I promise you that. And I'd like to encourage you to do that. But that's not the message here today. I just felt that God needed to speak that pastoral um, word of, of encouragement to us today. Today, what I wanted to talk about is Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus sends the disciples ahead of time, uh, ahead of him, and then comes out to meet him. Are you there in verse 22? If you're there, say amen. amen. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake or the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, he says in Greek, ego eimi, it is it is the parallel of what Jesus or what God says to Moses when he was talking to Pharaoh. He said, tell him, I am that I am sent you. Because ego means I and amis means I am. And so when Jesus says, tell them, it is I. He speaks to the disciples and says, it is I. He is saying, I am that I am. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus looked at him and said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. We're going to pick up on that portion of scripture in chapter uh, in verse 36 where the woman with the issue of blood touches the hem of Jesus's cloak next week so make sure you're here and invite a friend invite somebody who's going through a tough time somebody that needs to have their faith encouraged would you uh, bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer again this is a, a special prayer for the word and the receiving of God's word Lord Jesus I pray that you open our minds you open our hearts and you open our spiritual eyes that we might see beautiful things in your law today Father God, I ask that um, in the time that we have left, Lord Jesus, that we would leave here encouraged by what we heard and what we received, more encouraged than when we walked into these doors. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, and bless the Dodgers this year. And they not only will go to the World Series, but they win it all this year. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, and everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a hand clap. Give God a hand clap. It's okay. I know we already clapped, but let's do it again. Yesterday, I was at Judah's track, track meet in Chino. 
And uh, it was great just to be there with my son. It was still drizzling a little bit. But it was the best track meet that he had had in the last three weeks. And, you know, track and field has been a kind of up and down thing with my Judah. It's been an up and down thing with my Judah because he is so emotional. He has what we call emotional intelligence. Judah has immensely high highs and Judah has also very low lows. On the spectrum of emotions, Judah runs the whole gamut. I mean, when he is happy, man, he is elated as can be, and he is, he's got a smile from ear to ear. And when he is in the, in the dumps, I mean, he is feeling the blues. You might be that kind of a person where you've experienced that kind of a range. Maybe you're a teenager who's here today, and, and you're still trying to make sense of all of your hormones and all of the emotions that, that we experience and that we encounter on a daily basis. Um, but you know what? Teenagers, don't let your parents throw that whole emotional thing in you because we are so emotional too. We just do a, a better job at hiding them, don't we, folks? <laughs> but the first four weeks of Judah's track and field season, it was the hardest thing that I think he had ever gone through. The workouts were so hard. I mean, like grown up workouts. Talk about running. Four times during the workup, 600 meters, which is a lap and a half at full speed. That was the workout. The warm-up was a mile run. Besides the drills and the sprint work and the groundwork that these kids are putting in so that they become so physically fit and so worked up so that they can build strength that will, that will help them into their long season where then the speed and their technique will take over and build on the strength and the endurance that they're learning now. But after four weeks, there was a breaking point for Judah. And one particular practice, I remember, Judah looked up at me and I was in the stands and he just crumbled to the ground after they had just finished one of the 600 meters and he went, <laughs> and he looked up at me and said, Daddy, he said, I can't do this anymore. And I just looked up there, looked, looked from up top, and I said, no, Judah, you stay the Daddy's not going to rescue you now. You can do it. You got to dig deep. God will help you. You just have to focus and stay strong. Sure enough, he made it through the end of practice. After practice, he took off his, his spikes, and he put on his regular shoes, and he just came, and he threw on his bag, and he just jumped up into my arms, and he said, Daddy, carry me. I said, okay, Judah. And he got on my back and, and I started carrying Judah all the way to the car. Man, that boy's getting heavy, man. And then he whispered in my ear, Daddy, I think I need a break from track. And oh man, I go, yeah, I know how you feel, Judah. I used to run track when I was a kid too and it hurts, it hurts. Fast forward one more week. The, next, the very next week of practice, Judah was like a new man. He just needed his daddy to listen to him. He needed his mommy's shoulder to cry on. He needed a little consolation and rubbing of the back. He needed some massage on his legs and, and to encourage him to get back out there. The first day of practice, the very next week, Judah was well into the warm-ups. He was into the workout part of the, of the practice. And he finished one of his races and he broke through the line and he pointed up to heaven and he's like, yeah. I mean, you would have thought he had just won the gold medal at the Olympics. He was like, yeah. And he looked up to me and he was like, yeah, dad. And he started yelling at all, all his buddies. You know, there, there's JB and Kishana back there. Their kids are on the track club as well. And Judah started, come on, God, you guys could do it. You guys could do it. It was the same guy who was crying at the finish line the week prior. Of, uh, I need a break from track and field. In other words, can I quit? No. And it's been two steps forward with Judah. Then it's been one step back. It's going to be two more steps forward with Judah. And then it's going to be another step back before the end of the season comes. And this, this journey, this trek, if I can use that word, that Judah is, is on, it's, it's a lifelong process. 
Track and field is going to be Judah's thing. It's his love. It's in his blood. It's in his genetics. It's in his DNA. His mama was a track athlete and an all-American long jumper and quarter miler. His grandmama was a two-time Olympian and one of the greatest athletes to ever come out of Nigeria. It's in his blood. And Judah is just starting to learn what it takes to embrace it and to love it and come into form and to learn his own stride. Our faith is the same way. I love how Matthew uses Peter as a consummate example for you and I to learn about Peter's faith. Peter was a lot like Judah. Peter experienced amazing victories and Peter also experienced tremendous defeats. Jesus called Peter when he was calling him from his, his livelihood, which was to be a fisherman. And he says, Peter, come with me now. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And Peter said, okay. And he obeyed and he followed Jesus. And Peter left everything. He left the nets to follow Jesus. And then there was another time in, in the, the life of Peter and the disciples where they had come back from a long night of fishing and they did not catch a thing. They couldn't even ca catch a cold if they had wanted to that night. They came back and Jesus met them at the, at the seashore and Jesus says, what's up, fellas? Why the long faces? And they're like, well, we've been out fishing all night and we haven't caught a thing. And Jesus says, it's okay. Why don't you sit back out there, go back out into the water, except this time go a little deeper and then throw your net on the other side. Peter's like, come on, bro. We even have a fish detector. We got a radar, a sonar on this thing. We got a sonar. And, and uh, Peter was probably like, hey, Jesus, man. Hey, no offense, master, savior, Lord. But uh, last I checked, you were a carpenter, not a fisherman. You can leave the fishing business up to me. And, and, and James and John, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. But um, when it comes to fishing, I think we know what we're doing. And then Jesus just looked at him. He just gave him the eyes. He's just like, Peter's like, all right, fine. Lord, because you say so, we're going to go back out and we're going to get the net. Hey, guys, get the net. And we're going to throw it on the other side, like you say. And we'll see what happens. They caught 153 fish. The Bible says that there was so much fish that their nets began to rip and they could barely pull the nets back onto the shore. The catch th that day was amazing. And Peter was learning that faith also required obedience. Somebody say amen. amen. That faith also requires obedience. Amen. Go ahead, give God a hand clap today. Go ahead, it's all right. Faith requires obedience. So, so obedience and faith go hand in hand. And, and that's how our lives of faith, that's how our journeys of faith are built. Because faith is a process. If there was anything that you heard today, I want you to hear that faith is a process. Faith is like a spiritual two-step. Two steps forward, one step back. Jesus came walking on the water. The disciples saw Jesus. They were scared. They thought it was a ghost because they had never seen anything like that in their lives. It was a first. Then Peter, the bold one, Peter, the crazy one, Peter, the one who's up here and sometimes way down here. Peter, the one who Jesus oftentimes has to slap around and remind him who's in charge and what it's all about is the first one to call out. And what's crazy is that Matthew's the only one of the three gospels that this account is written that actually calls out to Jesus, engages in a dialogue with Jesus, and then does this. Watch. Lord, if that really is you, call me out unto the waters to you. Peter had the audacity. Peter had a, an amazing ambition to be just like Jesus. How many of you in here are crazy enough to want to be like Jesus? How many of you know sometimes, how many of you in here sometimes have that, the, the, the audacity to want to be like Jesus? How many, how many here? Jesus said, Peter's going to be a prime example of 
somebody I'm going to use to show my future disciples and people of faith that faith is a process. Faith is a journey of ups and downs. Faith is a journey of obedience. Peter, come follow me. I'm going to turn you into a fisher man. Yes, Lord. Obedience and then faith. Peter, now come and watch. I'm going to show you some things. He feeds the multitude. He feeds close to 20,000 people. And Peter's just like astounded, like, man, we were about to send these people away. But Jesus knew better. Jesus knew that he needed to show them some things so that he could help grow their faith, so that he can bring them to the next faithful step in their walks with Jesus, with him, with God. Jesus is walking out there and he sees the bow, he sees the disciples. Mark says he would have passed them by had they not called out. At which point, Peter says, call me out to you, Lord. The Bible says he actually, he says, command me to come out to you. When, if, you if you know what command means, it means that when somebody says something, it's imperative you do it. Peter was in a way testing Jesus to see if Jesus would actually call him out onto the water and allow him to be like Jesus. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. That's a pretty difficult thing for you and I to comprehend when it comes to living out our faith, isn't it? It's one thing to believe in a God that we have never really seen with our own eyes. It's one thing to believe in a God that we have, you and I have never actually touched with our own hands. It's another thing to see him walking on the water. And it's yet another thing to be the one that says to Jesus, if it's really you, Lord, call me on out there with you. Jesus says, come on, bro. What are you waiting for? Peter steps out of the boat. His gaze, his eyes focused on the Lord. He didn't see any, he didn't see the waves. He didn't hear the storm. He didn't see the wind. He didn't hear the wind. He didn't even look to his homies. He didn't even look around like, man, you guys, what do you think? Should I? Shouldn't I? It was a conversation between Jesus and Peter. It was a conversation between Peter, a man in the boat, and God walking on water. He didn't look to, to anybody to, for, for affirmation or for confirmation or any kind of encouragement. He didn't look for, to anybody to see whether or not he should take that step of faith. He knew he needed to take that step of faith. And Jesus knew that he needed to do this work in Peter to bring him one step closer to God. Peter stepped out onto the water. And when his foot hit the water, it was as if he was standing on solid ground. He was like, whoa, it wasn't like jello. He didn't have sea legs. It was just like he was standing on solid ground. Boom. He took another step. Boom. There was Peter walking on water, just like his Lord, just like Jesus was walking on water. And Peter began to make his way to Jesus when all of a sudden, Doubt, fear, obstacles, sickness, marital problems. A trial that your, one of your children go through. You begin to get attacked by the enemy. Opposition starts to, to come around and flank you from all sides. How many of you know when it rains, it pours? By the way, isn't it a beautiful season of rain that we're receiving right now? What an unbelievable catch. He said, no. He's like, my games have been canceled. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. But that's when you and I need to be reminded that whatever you're going through, whatever season that you're right now in the middle of, whether you're experiencing doubt, whether, whether you're going through a, 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 a period of difficulty and it's even hard for you to trust God, it's hard for you to keep coming to church, maybe it's even difficult to, to even open the Bible and just read just a verse or a word. Maybe, maybe you're at a time in your life when you're just like, I just don't know. I, I almost feel like I don't even know how anymore. I feel so distant from God. I was talking to a high schooler on Friday night at a conference and he came to me and he said, Pastor Josh, I don't think you, you know who I am. He says, I was at a camp in, in Ensenada, Mexico, two years ago when you were one of the speakers. And that night you were, you were talking about receiving the calling into ministry. And, and I, I received the call in my life to ministry, ministry. He said, but lately I've been going through a, a tough time in my life. 
I feel so cold in my relationship with God. I feel so distant. He goes, it was only two years ago that I, that I knew and discerned the calling on my life to ministry. But even today, as I sit here and talk with you, he said, I'm doubting whether or not I'm, I'm really supposed to go through with it because I don't even feel like I'm a good Christian right now, let alone go and pursue ministry. And I said, wow, bro, I go, it's not a coincidence that we're here today. God wants to encourage you in your walk. He wants to encourage you to keep stepping out on that boat and not let your eyes be distracted by stress or anxiety or pressures or doubt or anything else that the enemy wants to come and bring your way. God loved you so much that he reminded you today of his love for you. He's reminding you today of the calling that you have on your life to ministry and that God has an amazing future for your life. I said, life is like a whole bunch of faith islands. You give your life to Jesus and you're on fire and you're gung-ho and you'll run through a wall for Jesus. You'll lay hands on the sick and, and you'll have the audacity to believe that God will actually heal them and do a miracle when you're on fire. And then you go through a season, a period of life where you're walking between that faith island onto the waters and then you begin to sink and you begin to doubt until God comes again and brings you back up to another faith island where you get strong again and you grow your sea legs again and God starts to build you back up in your faith and before you know it, you're on the mountaintop and you're preaching the gospel again because you see God tangibly. You hear God tangibly and you can feel him and you can touch him and you can sense that God is working. And then you go through a season of doubt again. You go through a season of difficulty again. You and I, we, we, we step out of the boat of doubt and security and trust and we go out onto the sea of faith and in the moonlit sea, it's a dance with Jesus. Two steps forward and one step back and two steps forward. And one step back, Jesus said, come on, hang with me. Come on, let's go. Come on. Two steps forward and one step back. And two steps forward and one step back. And two steps forward and one step back. But before you know it, when you look back on your life, when you look back on your journey, and you look back on what God has done in your life, you see that the distance that you've traveled is enough. For that if Jesus were to take you home, if Jesus were to come and, 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 and come right now, he would say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Look at the distance. Look at the journey that you have embarked on and look where you are standing. Peter that day, he didn't start sinking because he did not know how to swim. Peter did not start sinking because he didn't know how to float. Peter began to sink because he had forgotten to believe. And that's how our faith is. It's a process. Don't give up on the journey that you've started. Allow the Lord to walk alongside you. Peter was sinking. The Bible says he called out. He said, Jesus, save me. Fear had crept back in and doubt. He lost self-confidence and he lost confidence in God. He forgot about the steps that he had already taken on the water. He was in the middle of a faith island and yet he had stepped right off of the faith island in that moment. You know, God can do a great thing in your life and Satan can come also and try to strip that thing away. It's like the seeds of faith that are cast out on the road and some are trampled upon, some are eaten up by the birds, some dry up and dry quickly and then others yet take root in good harvestable soil where God can work. Well, if you're going through a season of doubt, if you're going through a difficult time in your life, if, if it's even hard for you to be here in church today, I want to bless you. And I want to I just remind you that God is good and he still sits on the throne and he knows your struggles and he knows your pain. He knows what you're going through today and he hears your cries and he hears your prayers. And as Peter cried out to Jesus, and, and demanded to be rescued. He didn't ask Jesus, would you save me now, please? He was like, save me. 
And Jesus reached down his right strong arm and he picked Peter up right there where he was and Peter began to, to come back up to the surface of the water. And the Bible says that they went and got back into the boat. It doesn't say that, that Jesus picked Peter up and said, Peter, get on my back like Judah got on mine. It didn't say that, that Jesus picked up Peter and started carrying him to the boat. It doesn't say that Jesus threw him a lifesaver and said, hey, bro, come on, let's go. Will yourself in. Come on, I'm going to see you doggy paddle. It doesn't say that, does it? Jesus picked Peter back up and he pulled him back up on top of the water and they began to walk back together to the boat. All right. Jesus brought Peter back with him so that they could both continue to walk on the water in unison. Oh man, if that doesn't encourage you today, I don't know what will. All I know is that we serve a great and mighty God who loves you. He loves you so much. I used to always, uh, in my baseball days, I used to always say this. You can never steal second base with your foot sitting on first you know, sometimes in life it requires risks and Peter knew those risks because he was the kind that, that believed no risk no reward sometimes your faith is going to require risk sometimes you are going to be required by God to speak something into existence even though you know it is impossible even though you know it can't be done even though you know you can't do it by yourself you have to speak it you have to take that foot off of the base so you can go. You'll never be able to hit the homer if you never swing the bat. You'll never be able to throw that touchdown if you don't let go of that ball. You'll never be able to score that goal and see it soar into the top right hand corner of the net until you let go and let God use you. Peter was a usable man. Peter's life is a testimony to you and I of what God can do when somebody has the, the gumption to step out into the unknown and trust that God will remain with you. Whether you walk on water, whether you sink a little bit, know that he's going to be there to pick you back up. It's a journey. It's a two-step. It's a process. It's a moving forward and a little back and moving forward as you're making progress and as you're growing. Congratulations, Mia. God bless you. It's good to see you back. God bless you.